Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys. Good to see uh, our church is feeling well. I mean, a good number of folks here this morning, and I kind of like the, uh, I hate the fact that we're having so much flu and sickness in our schools, but I like the four on, four off schedule. Uh, that's right. I like that. Four days on, four days off, four days on, four days off. That's, so keep that going. It'll be great. We'll get to spring break eventually, Mike. It'll be great. Uh, so this morning, we turn a little bit of a corner, and uh, we're going to kind of go uh, as far as our title uh, is concerned anyway. We've been talking about, since the beginning of the year, uh, who's your one. And so that brought us up to last week. And so the way we continue with that, because that's a continual effort throughout the year, and the way we're going to continue that is how would you enter into a conversation with your one, with your person, about who Jesus is. How would you do that? Uh, Are you comfortable with that? Is that something that makes a lot of sense to you, or is that something that confuses you? Is that something that's really hard for you? And that's fine. Uh, And so I don't know where that lands with you, and I don't know who your one is. And so as we have more conversations about that, we begin to realize that, you know, your one may be a Christian, but they just may not be in church. That happens, okay? We call them unchurched, we call them de church, we talk, you know, lots of different reasons. Uh, some folks had a bad church experience growing up. Maybe they had a bad church experience as an adult, and, and things just didn't go well, and things were kind of ugly, and, you know, maybe they were a part of one of those ugly business meetings or whatever it was, and they said, you know, I can live better than this at home, and they quit going. It's real. It's real. It's all over our community, all over our country, all over our county. Those things are real. We just had a bad church experience, and we just quit going. So, how do you re engage those folks? How do you re-engage them? How do you help them to plug back in? How do you help them uh, to understand? And, and so one of the things that we find a lot of times, and this is very common, is that what was the source of belief? And, and this is what we find a lot in our universities. Uh, it's also what we're beginning to see in our high school. Uh, we have more and more young people who will tell you that they are agnostic, which means they just don't believe in God. Uh, that there is a God, or they, they are atheist, uh, where they just, that, you know, whenever this life is over and you close your eyes in death, that's it. Just, you're gone. And there's just, there is no more. There is nothing out there. There is no greater power. Um, and so, how do you engage someone like that? And what happens so many times is that we, I think, sometimes from a lack of understanding, from a lack of, of knowledge, from a lack of, and this is where we really, and this is something that I've always been very, it's been very important to me at Living Faith, and, and it's something that we've really focused on mostly since I've been here as pastor, is a discipling process, okay? There must be a discipling process in place for people to grow in faith. You have to be able to grow, and you hear me say all the time that circles are better than rows, and you need to be in multiple circles, okay? Okay? You need a group of people that you grow with. You need a group of people that you read, study the Scripture, have those conversations weekly. Okay? You need to be in that, in that process of growing all the time. And so if you're not plugged into that, if you're not plugged into a, 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 a place of growth, then you just kind of will stagnate. And, and so many times we, we find this, and I find a lot of folks that have grown up, and, and what's happened is, is that at some point in time they were, they were, they were given a question, or they were, they were confronted with the gospel, and, and, and so and they're like, well, you know, I don't want to go to hell. We talked about that a few weeks ago, so sign me up, okay? And I believe. You got to believe, brother, okay? You just got to have faith, sister, okay? You just got to believe. And, and, and what happens is, is if we don't get discipled and we don't really understand, then we were never really understanding of what we experienced. And then along comes a professor, or along comes a book, or along comes you know, somebody else on television or whatever, and they talk us out of what we were never really talked into in the first place. And, and so then all of a sudden, it's like, how do these kids do that? How do they just all of a sudden become a group of atheists? Or how do these things? And, and it's because they were never discipled, and they, never, and they don't really understand what we believe anyway. Well, th- this is something that I've always taught, and I've always been taught. And, and as I go back and I, and I research, and, and where I can tell you with, with multiple years, 20 plus years of pastoral experience, that I would tell you the same thing. If you're a new believer, or you're considering becoming a believer, or you're trying to figure this whole thing out, a really good place to start reading in this book would be the book of John. Okay? And if you would turn to the Gospel of John and read John's account okay, of his time with Jesus, that that would be a great place to start. And so what we're going to do over the next uh, seven or eight weeks uh, as we move toward Easter is we're going we're to journey with John. We're going to take a journey with John, 
And we're going to go through and we're going to experience some of the things that John experienced. And, and as we experience those things, I hope for you that maybe for some of you, for the very first time, a light goes on and you say, wow. Or maybe for some of you, it's a refresher course to say, okay, this would be a great place to have a conversation. Maybe I can get somebody to read this with me. Maybe we can sit down and have a discussion. Maybe we can have a debate. Maybe we can, we can enter into a conversation with someone and, and, and use John as our guide. So we're going to take a journey with John. And as we go through this process, hopefully uh, the Holy Spirit will reveal to us a multitude of things that we can use in, 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 in helping those that are around us. You see, in the first century, it, it was the same thing. You see, J Jesus did not come to his disciples. He didn't come to John and say, Hey, John, I'm the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and you just need to believe that, brother. You just need to believe that on faith, and I'm just going to tell you that right now, and if you've got something around here, I'll sign it for you, and I'm going off to someplace else, and, and, and I won't ever see you again. That's not what Jesus did. As a matter of fact, Jesus' invitation to the disciples and his invitation to John was, follow me. If you'll just come and hang out with me, if you'll just come and be with me, you'll, you'll see some things. Okay? You're going to realize some things. You're going to experience some things. And, and I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to say that after three years, you're going to know. And let me tell you, after a lifetime, when John writes his gospel, when he finally puts it down, it was the last one that written Okay, we have, we, have, we have Peter's account. Mark gives us Peter's account of his time with Jesus. We have, we have Matthew's account. He was the one who was the tax collector, and, and Jesus called him out of the tax collector's booth. And, and, and then we have Luke's account from a Gentile perspective that he carefully researched. He interviewed all of these people. And so those accounts we had, but we didn't have John. And so John, toward the end of his life, gives us his account of his time with Jesus. And, and, and here's the thing. Whenever you write something... You know, if, you, if, you, if you've gone through training and, 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 and why we write papers or we write whatever, any good English teacher will teach you that you should have a thesis statement. You should have a purpose for writing, okay? A purpose for writing that guides what you're going to write so that you just don't write some misguided gibberish, okay? So that you have some purpose for what you're writing so that you have a reason for that. John gives us that. Okay, And so where I want to begin in looking at John's gospel is, is in John uh, chapter uh, 20 and verse 30. He gives us his thesis statement. Okay, And this is why he wrote this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. We're going to come back and talk about this word signs in a moment, which are not recorded in this book. But he did record some things for us. Okay, But these are written. Why? This is the purpose I'm writing this. These are written that you may believe. That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. This is why he wrote it. This is why he wrote it. That you may believe that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is why he wrote it. And we have it. And, and we, listen, I challenge you. Go back and dig through this. Go back and dig through that. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got somebody in your life that's like, it's, it's a fairy tale. Okay, let's go back and let's dig. Let's go find that. And let's find out how old this writing is. Let's go back and look and see where it came from. Let's go back and dig back through the ancient manuscripts. Let's go back and find the origin of this book. Let, let's, let's do the work. Let's do the research. There's, there's all kinds of great resources that you can find out there that you can go through and you can dig this out and you can find this out. But this is the purpose of his, of his gospel is that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by, by believing, you may have life in his name. See, here's the thing. The disciples were in and out, off and on, hot and cold. I mean, you can just chronicle them all the way through. There, there were moments that it was like, wow! And there were other moments that it was like, <laughs> I don't know who this guy thinks he is. Okay? I don't know if he knows who he is. I mean, come on. There, there were times that Jesus said that Jesus, Jesus came out and said, hey, listen, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you can't have any part of me. And everybody was like, <coughs> wow, we're out of here. Okay? And everybody left. 
And the disciples were like, you know, uh, the fish are biting, and we could go back to fishing. And Jesus is like, you, you don't want to leave too, do you? Well, maybe. They were in and out. They were off and on. And, and listen, when he, when he was crucified, when he found, because there was all these moments, and it was like, we're going to go back to Jerusalem. Oh, no, we don't want to go back to Jerusalem. Last time we were there, they almost stoned you. And, you know, we are your disciples. We're hanging out with you. And when somebody throws stones, they may not have good aim, and they hit you, they're going to hit us. There were times that it was like, I just don't know. And listen, when Jesus died on the cross, when he died, when they, when they arrested him that night, everybody scattered. There were no hardcore followers of Jesus. There was no great big circle of people that all gathered around. There were none of them. They all left and went and hid. I mean, a middle school girl came and asked Peter, do you know? I don't know. You know about I don't know. But everybody hit the unfollow button. Unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. We don't know who this guy is. No, none of them. And so John went through a process of coming to belief in Christ. It was a process for him. It was a step-by-step process. And when he come to the end, because Jesus didn't stay dead, did he? He rose from the dead. He came out of the tomb. He appeared to John. John was with him. And so John then took that and everything else that he had experienced and said, it's him. It's him. It is him. This is God. This was God in the flesh standing beside me. I know who it is. And for the rest of his life, for the rest of his life, he proclaimed who Christ was. And then he wrote down his account for us. And we have a copy of it. And most of you carry it around in your phones, okay? And you have it. And it's been preserved through the ages for over 2,000 years, this document that John wrote about his time with Jesus. And in that document, in in that time that he had, he points out to us what he calls signs. He points out to us multiple signs that Jesus did that points to who he was. A lot of you refer to them as miracles. But John realized that these were not random acts of kindness on Jesus' part. Each one of these things that Jesus performed was for the purpose of pointing us to who his identity was. This is what John realized. These were not just random acts. These pointed out, these signs pointed to Jesus' identity and who he was. The first one that John gives us comes from chapter 2 in his book. And it's a story that uh, I think had been told so many times. It was an account that that this actually happened. Everybody knew this. Everybody who was there witnessed this. Everybody who was there saw what happened. And so John gives us this account of what took place. It says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. This is not made-up fairy tale. This is detail. Okay, There's detail to this story because this happened. And and Jesus' mother was here at this wedding. Now, if if you're not, you can go back and, 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 and look up and find out what a Jewish wedding ceremony looks like. But it's not your basic Baptist wedding, okay? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I asked a pastor one time, he, he, had a, he had somebody come to him and said, how much do you charge to do a wedding? He said, first 20 minutes are free. After that, it's $100 a minute, okay? So that's a Baptist wedding, right? And, and so, but Jewish weddings go on for, for days, all right? They're celebrations. And it's not just the ceremony itself, but it goes on for days. And so it's a big celebration. People come, and they would stay, and, and they would have this big, big, uh, big time of, of fellowship and all these things going on. And so we don't really know... But it appears, in reading this, that, that Jesus' mother was more than just a casual attendee. Because she has, a lot of, um, she has a lot of vested interest in how things are being taken care of. Okay? She's not just somebody that's going to walk up because of what's getting ready to happen in the account that we have. That, that if she was just a random attendee, that she would just come up to her son and go, Can you believe that? I mean, they had no more planning than this. They, they ran out of wine, okay? Can you believe that? Okay, but instead, she feels like they need to do something about it. And so, so Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So John is there. He's an attendee of this wedding as well. And the other people that Jesus have called are all here. When the wine was gone, 
Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Okay, and so you guys, you know, when you go to a wedding, especially if you're going to be there for, for a time, this is like running out of cake, okay? It's like running out of punch. It's like, you know, we've got our guest list, you know, and for me it's like there's no more barbecue, okay? And so, I mean, dude, all right? I mean, what are you thinking? And, and, and so, so they're out of wine, and she comes to him, and, and, and this is his response. He says, woman, time out, okay? Guys, this is Valentine's week, okay? This, this ain't cool at home, okay? So just don't say, that's what Jesus said, okay? Because it won't work, okay? So let me just let you in on that. Uh, because the, it's translated accurately, but the, the presentation is a little bit uh, different. And so this was not a, uh, would you get away? Because he couldn't say, Mom. Uh, and, and so it's, it's more of a, my lady, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a term of, uh, of respect. And, and then he says, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Now, again, I'm not trying to add to the scriptures, but when you read this, it makes you wonder, what did she know? What did she know? I mean, come on, we just, we're, we're just trying to figure it out, right? Because why would she ask? She knew to call on her son in some time of trouble, okay? When there was an occasion that needed fixing, she knew that she could call on her son. Now, we don't know why. We don't know if, hey, Mom, could you bake some of those, you know, those cookies or whatever it is? You know, well, we don't have any flour. Well, look again, <laughs> okay? Uh, because I think we do. And, and I'd like some of those cookies, okay? And so whatever it is, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what she knew. I don't know what she had seen. I don't know what it was like to grow up in Jesus' house, Okay? We just know that for 30 years, he was just a regular guy. But Mary knew there was something special about her son. I mean, some special people showed up when he was born. And so there was a lot of special things surrounding this young man. And so she knew there was something special about him. And so she knew that this was somebody that she could call on in this time. And so she doesn't even get specific about it. He says, why do you involve me? And she says to the servants, just do whatever he says. I don't know what he's going to do, but it's going to be cool. And so you just do whatever he says. And she just leaves. She just walks off. Just do whatever he tells you. And so now Jesus decides to act. Why? Because mama told him to. <laughs> okay? And that's what we do, right? Okay? I mean, my mama calls me and says, I need you to do this. I don't go, well, that's not what I do. <laughs> okay, mom. That's what we'll do. And so nearby stood six stone water jars. And this is where it gets interesting. Because he could have done this multiple ways. But this is how he chose to do it. These are the kind that used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. And, and so what, what, what happens here, and what we begin to see is that up until this point, and this is John's reflection, because John says there were signs. That Jesus gave us signs. And John looks back on this and says, we had a save you from your sins covenant with God. It was called the temple. Okay? And we had priests who worked there. And, and, and they would sacrifice animals on behalf of our sins. And, and, and in order to be clean in doing that, they would use these jars of water for ceremonial washing. And so Jesus is pointing to something that he is about to replace. And so he tells them, take those jars and fill them up. Each one of these are, hold 20 to 30 gallons. He says, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them all the way to the brim. And, and, and then in verse 8, he, he tells them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet, and this is where you almost think when John's writing this down, that this story had been told so many times that everybody just knew. Okay, And so he, he adds it kind of as a footnote. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, just so you know. And he didn't know where it came from. They just brought it to him and said, here. And so he tasted it. And then he says this. Everybody brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine 
afterwards, okay? Because then they don't really care, okay? After everybody's had too much to drink. But, but instead, you have saved the best until now. And God had, okay? And God had. Because Jesus was about to replace the old covenant. He was about to replace what those jars represented. The ceremonial cleaning that had to take place before the sacrifice, all of that was about to go away. All of that was about to go away. And all of a sudden, it, that, that, it should have been the good stuff first, but instead, God had saved the best for last. And John looks back on this and says, I see it now. I see what he was up to. I understand what he was up to. And so this wasn't just a, a miracle. Uh, this wasn't just Jesus saving the day. Jesus was performing a sign that pointed to what was about to take place. You saved the best until now. And so John says in verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And because, look at this. Okay, listen. Not just because somebody said so, but because of what they saw. All of his disciples were here. And this was the first moment when they said, huh, normal people can't do this. How did he do this? We sat here and watched it happen. We watched them fill it with water. And it became the choicest of wine. Good wine takes time. Okay? You can't make it over the snap of a finger, but Jesus did. And it wasn't just, ooh, that's kind of fermented quick, wasn't it? No. Instead, it was like, wow, this is the best. This is the best. And his disciples saw it. They saw him perform it. And they said, wow, there's something special about this man. This was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And because of that, his disciples believed in him. Why did they believe? Why did they believe? Because they were eyewitnesses. It's because of what they saw. It's because of what they saw. You understand that. There are things that you have seen in your life, and you would have said, if I had not seen that, I would have never believed it. Okay, every time I work cattle, okay, every time I work cattle, I see them do something that I've never seen before in my life. And if you tried to tell me that one would do that, I would say, no. But I believe it because I've seen it with my own eyes. It's like I didn't think they could fit through a hole that small. But they did. I would have never believed that unless I saw it. Now, think for just a moment. Unlike John, our faith doesn't come by seeing that miracle occur, does it? I wasn't there, and neither were you, okay? I wasn't there, and neither were you. And here's the thing. Sometimes people come to faith by something that they see, okay? Sometimes people come to faith by, by something they see. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> we come to faith by what we hear. Okay, we come to faith by what we hear. And, 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 and so John wrote this down, and he wrote this account of what happened, and then we hear it. And we come to faith by what we hear. And John says, look, this is why. In John chapter 3, verse 16, you all know John 3, 16, don't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. John says, look, you got to know who he is. I saw him. I was with him. I witnessed it. And he wrote it down for us. He witnessed it, and he saw it. And John would say to us, and he says to us in his gospel, I was just a simple fisherman. I was just a simple fisherman. And because of what I saw and because of what I witnessed, I walked away from my family business. 
I walked away from my dad. I walked away from what I was, was destined to do for my entire life and I gave my whole life to Jesus. It happened. Okay? It happened. It's real. It took place. And John says, look, I just want you to go on a journey with me so that, that, that as I document these events and as you read them and as you understand that they are true, these are not fairy tales. These are not Disney stories, okay? This is not somebody just dreamed up and you just go back and you can go back 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 years and somebody just once upon a time in a land far, far away wrote this down, okay? There's lots of things that we read and you can go back and find the origin of it, okay? I love Star Wars, but you can go back and find not very long ago, <laughs> somebody wrote it down. They made the story up. They just, and sometimes they made it up as they went, Okay? I mean, they'll just tell you. It's like, well, we shot episode one and, and, or episode four, and then in five we decided to go this direction, and, and then we'd come up with another idea, and we see that all the time. But folks, this goes back over 2,000 years. You can trace it down. You can go hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago and find manuscripts, and you can read the same story. And you can go all the way back, and Luke went all the way back, and John goes all the way back to his eyewitness account of his time with Jesus, and we can trace it back. It goes all the way back. To the moment that it happened. Some things we believe because of who tells us, don't we? When someone tells us this is the way this is and this is the way this happened, we say, I believe it. Right? I mean, Grandpa told you things. Mamma told you things. Mom told you things. And it's like, this is the way this happened. And it's like, I have no reason to, to dispute that because we trust them. Listen, there's so many people out there now that have such a distrust of this book, okay? And, and, and we have to help restore that faith, okay? We have to help restore that faith. There's lots of words, okay? There's lots of devices and lots of ways that we can access things. And so we just think that people just dream things up and they just come up with this. And somebody just made up the story that Jesus changed water into wine and that somebody just made it all up. Listen, we've done the research. I invite you to go with me and journey. Let's go back and dig through. You, you can dig back through and you, can, and you can find this text to its origin. That John was there. He witnessed it. And he saw it. John says, I have chosen to document these events so that you might believe. So I invite you to begin a conversation with your one. I invite you to begin a conversation. That the time that we're going to spend over the next several weeks will set the stage for you to be able to invite your one to come. Maybe it's Easter. Maybe it's before. But engage in that conversation. Try to open up the door to, to a debate. If you, if you have that person in your life, if you know those, those, those students, if you know those people in your life, it's like, I just, you know, I, all that stuff's just hocus pocus. Invite them to have a conversation. Invite them to sit down and debate. You've you, you got to do some studying, okay? Because I'm just going to tell you, you just got to believe, brother, won't get it with them, okay? You just got to have faith, sister, won't get it with them. It won't work. You're going to have to do some homework. You're going to have to take them to the text. You're going to have to prove it. Okay? And this is what I want you to feel okay about. All right? Jesus spent three years proving it to his very first disciples. He didn't, the, the Messiah himself, the Son of God himself, did not walk out onto this planet and say, Y'all just got to believe, brothers, and I'm out. No. He, this is just the first of, of seven signs that John outlined that we're going to go through. There are things that he did in their presence that made them go, I have no doubt. Okay? I have no doubt. And they still doubted. Okay? They still doubted. Because the guy that they saw do all these things couldn't die, could he? He didn't stay dead. He's the only one. He's the only one who predicted his own death, endured it, and overcame it, and walked out of it. I'm for that guy, okay? And John was too, because John was with him. He was with him on both sides of the cross. 
And he was like, I am 100% convinced of who he is. Listen, you have the text. You have the knowledge. You have the ability to, to, to share with us. Because listen, Satan will use whatever he can to tear that down. It, it's, a scary, it's a scary existence that we live in because so many people have turned their back on it. You know, I, I, when, you, when you read a statistic, it's one thing. But when you experience it, it's another. I've read the statistic that in Germany, the millennial age group, 90% of millennials in Germany of that age group, the, the, uh, they don't know a Christian. Not that only 10% of them are. 90% of them don't even know anyone who proclaims to be a Christian. I read that statistic. Okay, I read it because it's in Germany. That's not where I am. But a few weeks ago, when I was at Chrysalis, um, this young lady, and she's living in McLean County right now, um, she's from Germany. She's a German exchange student. And so I sat down with her at lunch, and I began to ask her these questions to verify what I've been reading and what I've been told. And guess what? She verified it. She says, no, there is no... She says, Jesus, this is so funny the way she said it, that Jesus not such a big deal in Germany as he is here. And I was like, wow. She said, we don't have churches like this. We don't have young people. Because she's a Christian. She said, we don't have all of these things that you all have. We don't have these people and all these young people that want to, want to learn and want to know. And she says, very, very few, very few. And I'm like, this is the place where the Protestant Reformation took place. Okay? This is, this is Martin Luther. This is where, and she was actually Lutheran. And so she, she grew up in the Lutheran church. And so when you begin to see that, you begin to realize that that's coming here. Okay? That's coming here. That's the fear. The fear is that, that, that in, 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 in 10, 20 years from now, that people in our community would say, I don't even know anybody who goes to church anymore. I don't even know anybody who does. Listen, folks, it can happen. We are one generation away from complete lostness. When we don't transfer our faith to the next generation, well, that's what happens. One generation away from complete and total lostness. I challenge you to spend some time over the next few weeks and set the stage. Spend some time with John. Spend some time on a journey with John and prepare yourself to be able to enter into a conversation when it allows itself, when the Holy Spirit allows itself, and you begin to have those conversations. Because, listen, you don't know what church experience they've had. You don't know what background they're coming from. You don't know what they've encountered. But what you do know and what you do have is the truth, and you have Jesus. Okay? So what are you going to do with that? At this time of invitation, I, I challenge you, if you need to pray for that person, come on. It's a great time. If you need to pray for you, maybe, and maybe for you, maybe some of you are here today and it's like, you know what, I never really thought about it this way. My whole salvation is just kind of built on somebody said, you got to believe. And I said, okay. But I really didn't know that he truly is the Son of God. Maybe that light bulb came on for you for the first time today. If that is, come on. Okay? However he's calling you to respond, however he's calling you to reflect, just do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you preserve for us an account of what you did while you were here on this earth. Father, that you came, that you became one of us, that you experienced everything that we experienced, yet you never sinned, that you lived a sinless life, but yet paid the price for all of our sins. Father, that you became flesh, and dwelt with us. That you were Emmanuel. That you were God with us. And Father, I'm so thankful that, that those who you touched. Those who you walked beside. The signs that you performed were witnessed by man. And that they recorded those events. And gave them to us. So that we would know. And then we would believe. Father, maybe someone here this morning that needs to come for the very first time. This, this, is, this is that moment for them. And Father, there may be someone here that's going, oh, I know that person he's talking about. I deal with them every day. We have lunch every day. And they are so lost. 
and they are so bitter and they don't want to talk about God. I just need to come and I just need to pray that the Spirit softens their heart. I need, to, I need the courage to be able to open the pages of the book of John and just say, would you read this with me? Can we just have a conversation? Can we just, what, what's your hang up? What's your holdout? What do you not believe? And that God would give us the wisdom, that God would give us the words, that God would give us the ability to lead them to the life-changing power of Christ and that they may have life and have it to the full. Father, just guide us on this journey and guide us now in this time of invitation and reflection and help us to respond in the way you've called us. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Come out of sadness from wherever.